The game that we will be doing today was the predecessor of uh, uh, online after the fall game. Uh, so if you are familiar with the lore uh, and elements of uh, online version, some things will be uh, repetitive for you here. here. But uh, that being said, this is a very different game, which serves ultimately different purpose and requires an altogether different set of skills to prepare. So let us begin. As always, uh, this is uh, our agenda, structure, preparations, and the briefing uh, standard stuff here. So uh, our document, uh, in this presentation, uh, I suppose I will be uh, going more to the document because a lot of things are really in detail elaborated on uh, in the document. Um, and uh, here's quite a few technical nuances that uh, I'll try to show you. And we go straight into the structure of the game. So this game is about working as an entire group to achieve a goal. Uh, this game actually can be won, uh, can be finished by participants only if they at some point reach the mm, immersion and uh, synergy where every single person acts as a member of a greater whole. Therefore, uh, what is important is that this game naturally will if it is if they are able to finish it uh, it will show you natural leaders within your groups because uh, there will emerge a person with an overarching vision uh, that has enough social backing so as to coordinate others uh, if that doesn't happen uh, it won't be easy for them to uh, manage all the tasks, but this game is not uh, like you don't have to win the game to gain uh, something from it. Even failure in this game is a success from uh, from our standpoint, from the organization uh, organizer's standpoint. So. This game is also about overcoming fear and hard uh, and hardship, and I mean as much fear and as much for hardship as we can feasibly apply to them. Um, the game is uh, all about mood, but not imaginary mood. Uh, we will try to really uh, tackle those innate. Uh, anxieties and fears uh, of uh, creatures in the dark, uh, darkness itself, not being able to see properly, uh, having to restrain yourself and your emotion. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's that, that kind of stuff. Then immersing in devastation that is caused by radicalization. We would like them to feel it as viscerally as possible and more on that later uh, and uh, in the end but least but not the last last but not the least uh, learning more about the difficulty of actually seeing the bigger picture this game really is about how it is really 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 hard to be able to uh, process in our little primate brains uh, situations involving more than few people at a time. Like if there are several teams playing this game, if there is no single person dedicated to coordinating them, this will be a giant mess. Uh, and basically this is a part of the game. This is how it's, it's supposed to be. Um, so uh, primary goal of this game is consciousness. Uh, I mean, consciousness uh, like uh, being aware. 
being aware of things, of people, of situation, of possible danger, everything that's, um, that, that can be attributed to this word. And specific goal, make the participants realize, realize how difficult it is for a group of people to coordinate any effort and how easy it is to fall into chaos. Uh, as the message here is that, well, people try to coordinate as a species and they fell into chaos. Uh, so to the actions of, the, of that little Vanguard squad uh, entering the building will be reminiscent of this chaos or not. Maybe they will rise above it. So more straightforward. Uh, we want a certain mood. In this case, it will be apprehension, tension. Uh, then we want people to overcome this uh, unease and this apprehension uh, and other limitations we will impose on her, uh, on them. Then uh, we want them, of course, to overcome uh, inconveniences mm, and hardships. We want to encourage them to see past the limited view of a personal agenda. So maybe there will be a need to take one for the team. Maybe, maybe someone will be able to do it. From my, ex from my experience with playing games, there are certain people which are more than happy to make a glorious uh, final stand so that the rest may do their objectives. And this time, uh, I believe that they will be having fun. Uh, so, so yeah. Uh, secondary goals. We would like to achieve a movie-like immersion of participants. We want them to really feel like they are at this very moment starring within a movie. And what will be an element of this? They will be recording themselves with their cell phones. During the incursions into the darkness, they will be making videos, which will uh, be, uh, of course, collected by uh, facilitator. But the feeling of being recorded will change their behaviors, even if they are somewhat used to being recorded, somewhat used to the fact that uh, you have your cell phone and you can record or take a photo of everything at will, this will be something different. So we want to uh, record their progress so as to acquire promotional materials for later use, uh, to have this uh, um, materials uh, to prepare later, uh, like, I don't know, promote the game in different audiences or what have you. And introduce knowledge about the result of large scale civil unrest. So that's pretty self-explanatory, especially if you have been to the uh, after the fall online training. So the narrative, uh, not many differences here. Uh, we are in the apocalypse, everything went south and uh, people are living in separated, isolated communities where they try to uh, scratch for a living, uh, scratch some secrets from the previous age. What killed people? In general, climate change, but uh, in this version of the game, the backstory is not uh, necessarily as detailed as in the online game because here it is secondary, completely secondary. You can insert in any civil unrest, any apocalypse, anything that you wish, and it will be fine. Um, so you can tell your participants that we don't know what happened or you can tell them whatever. And the amount of knowledge they will have upfront won't uh, make, uh, will make a positive impact on the game, but more on that later. The more they know, the, the different the game will play. But anyways, uh, like as for the lore and the backstory, sky is the limit. You just do whatever you feel like goes with them, uh, will be cool for them. 
Uh, of course, here is uh, our uh, wonderful EPIC, like European Pact for Combating the Climate Change. Uh, everything is created uh, on the same canvas, so uh, you might remember these guys. Multinational corporation uh, that began as NGO, but later on took control of most of the uh, crucial and strategic, strategic industries in the Europe. Um, specializing in creating uh, technological marvels, um, high-tech um, engineering and uh, artificial intelligence. So you might remember this one. Uh, the facilities are the hubs of knowledge. And this facility is the main hub of knowledge. So our participants will essentially be, uh, be entering uh, the biggest and the most important facility of EPIC, so European Pact for Combating the Climate Change. Uh, and they know it from the start that this was their biggest facility. And this time they will, of course, you will need to provide them with maps, but those maps that were made uh, by me for my imaginary facility won't, won't do. Here you will have to actually have maps, maps of real environment in which they will be traversing. Uh, so uh, bear that in mind. Uh, of course, as usually, I will be already saying things about the preparation phase uh, to round them up later on. But this facility was overrun and now is uh, a desolated ruin uh, stalked by monsters, because why not? So, uh, the goals, the ghost, and the database. The goal from the perspective of the players of this game is to get the database. And they know that the database is like the sacred grail of knowledge. Uh, it's a one... Uh, multi-dimensional drive uh, made, um, I don't know if you knew, but there are multi-dimensional crystals, like five, five dimensional, six dimensional crystals in real life. So this is a crystal, uh, of course, not like a gem, but it's a box containing crystalline matrix that possesses some total of human knowledge, everything. So from the literally uh, literature to literature to history to chemistry to um, like physics everything that people accumulated as a species uh, before the fall is on that uh, sing single drive. If they are able to acquire it, they will be good to go with reshaping the world anew. Uh, preferably taking uh, some advices from uh, people that uh, desolated themselves in the previous generations. Of course, they know that there are ghosts. And what are the ghosts? Uh, ghouls you might know, but I will speak about them more uh, later. But the, the ghosts are artificial in intelligences. They are... Uh, Either they possess a physical form or they are hollow projections of uh, AIs governing uh, elements of this facility. In this facility, there will be three of them and they, as they are an AI, uh, have their own uh, mannerisms, they have own uh, technical locks on them imposed by their creators, but are more or less human in behavior. Uh, but these are the only uh, people, people, only entities within the, uh, within the facility that will allow participants to get to the database uh, and interactions with them will be important. It will be not like Vanessa, which is an overarching menace that's somewhere in the facility and does generally evil things. Uh, but here they are uh, 
playable characters. There are characters that will be interacted with, uh, spoken with. They will have their own challenges to give. And uh, this is generally important. As for the ghouls, the ghouls, what are the ghouls here is, depends completely on your idea. They may be mutants, they may be monsters, but I, of course, advise uh, the ghouls to be my, uh, my, my uh, terrifying creation, meaning the exoskeleton that was initially uh, created so as to facilitate work in a uh, hazardous condition. Uh, intention, in its intent, in its inception, it was meant to um, be uh, psychically controlled by a person using a data stack in the in the in the brain. Uh, but of course, they possess their own rudimentary AI. Uh, unfortunately, when the facility uh, were overrun and things were going really badly there was some i don't know mutagenic gas or something like this people decided to transfer their consciousness from their biological body, bodies to uh, to ghouls uh, but of course ghouls weren't able to process uh, something as complex as uh, a person's intelligence so yeah we have this eviscerated uh, half conscious creatures that are constantly cold and constantly constantly hungry, very irritable, and you know that's that's a freaky stuff. Uh, and of course, ghouls in this game will have to be played by facilitators slash participants. It depends on your decisions, but more on that later. Mm -hmm. And we have my uh, wonderful Elysium, my beloved Elysium which is a city of survivors, uh, an alliance of civilian uh, industries and uh, military complex, uh, which they were able to withstand the initial chaos and later uh, coalesce the nearby settlements and, and survivors into one pretty healthy community organized uh, like the Greek nation state. I really like the idea of Greek nation states, so you can think about them as that. In the initial version of the game, the more uh, story-driven, uh, there you were all the names were in Greek and stuff like that. So yeah, I like them. And we have the Ariadna troops. Uh, and this will be our participators. The Ariadna troops are the uh, cream of the crop of the uh, Elysian military. They are upgraded with neural stacks in their brains so as to be able to uh, interface with arcane technology uh, and uh, their weapon systems, which are pre-fall. So this is the situation in the... Mm, like this, the story that is really needed to be conveyed to participants. Uh, we know that th there is a com com complex in the wastelands. Uh, Ariadna squads go in to find the database because they know that there's a database inside. In this is a difference between online and offline. Offline, you know that it is inside. There's no uncertainty. You need to extract this. We I needed to make this quite easier. So there is an uh, HQ and HQ this time will be a playable location. It will be a very important location in this, this interactions within HQ will be very important part of the game. I would say maybe not the core, but the backbone, the backbone of the game. Uh, several squad goes, uh, squads go missing. And uh, they themselves, of course, can go missing as well. So there is a mechanic of death in this game. Uh, and squads of participants may be knocked out of action. And it is assumed, and uh, I would suggest you emphasize this, that if a squad goes eliminated, goes MIA, missed in action, they are, they are actually killed in actions. They are, they are dead. 
But of course, we don't want participants that get eliminated to stop playing after, for example, an hour of the game. So we give them a respawn. So that's not the same squad, not the same people, not the same, uh, not not basically the same um, agents, but uh, a new uh, support squad entered the game. Reinforcements have arrived, and they can go uh, play again. Um, in the in the game, so hostile entities are confirmed within the facility. Uh, it is up to you uh, whether you inform um, participants what these entities are. Of course, now that you have films, movies for the uh, for the after the fall, uh, like uh, online, you can use those movies in the offline uh, version to. Type participants. For example, you can use this uh, this movie where Goran explains to them what are the goals and how you should avoid them, not to be uh, triggered by them. Because here it will be hard enough because they will not be imagining going through this place. They will actually go through the darkness uh, with just a single flashlight knowing that this flashlight will attract creatures that will actively hunt them. Uh, and more, I will speak more on that later, but you understand that knowledge is power and the more knowledge you give them in the beginning, the easier this game will be for them because uh, knowing and actually applying the knowledge are two different uh, things. So uh, your discretion is advised. Then uh, resources are running low. In this uh, game, resources are actually uh, important uh, elements, but not to the point like in the online version, because um, here, uh, because I wanted people to be able to play from the beginning to the end, resources are rather, uh, they are my scapegoat, uh, why can't you do something? Like this is this is rather a moderating tool, not uh, something that is game breaking or game changing. Uh, I will tell more about resources later, how they work. But just bear in mind that if you for some reason decide to skip the resources all uh, altogether, fine by me. That's that's okay. That's only one more thing that get, makes this game more complicated. So if you decide that whoa, this game is complicated as it, as it is. You can throw them out of the window and uh, I will tell you how to work around this. So the NPCs, there are a lot of them. This game, uh, and you uh, see, I hope a disclaimer, no, not yet. There will be a disclaimer soon uh, speaking about this, but as you can see, this game requires a lot of stuff. It is made for a lot of participants, really. You can play even with 50 people into the, in this game uh, because this is something that I call uh, uh, MLARP, so uh, Massive uh, Live Action Role Play. Uh, I, uh, for time, specialized in doing this uh, as, for example, I was going for a camp and there was like 350 people so I made a game for entirety of them. Like four, 350 people were playing at the same time with different roles, different economies. And these games tend to last for entire night, entire day. This one, I tried to, tried to scale this down a bit. Uh, but as a, as a genre, it is, it is really awesome. Uh, and uh, so depending on the amount of people you will need from one to six people uh, role-playing as ghouls. So they will be dressed in rags. I don't know, their faces would be covered or, or painted black. Uh, you can, for example, what I found works awesome is if they have this uh, bands, uh, the luminescent bands, like uh, they reflect light. You, you may be, the, the, these, the re reflective foil. So when the participants 
put a, a string of light from their flashlight on them, they instantly see them. And this is like, whoa, like, like you would see the eyes of a predator in the dark. So this, this, this works excellent. Uh, the ghouls will be, uh, as said here, hostile and mobile, patrolling the corridors. Uh, must be avoided or tricked, and I will um, tell you more on this in a second. Uh, uh, well, ghouls will have their own separate chapter, so then I will speak in large about them. Uh, the, so I have stated that they are simple workforce and security automatons gone rogue. So this is like the less dark version with, that they are just robots uh just ai but uh, you can go with the the darker version that there are human uh mutilated intelligences inside as for the ghosts as i said before uh you need whoa 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 you need three uh f people playing as ghosts uh, because there's a records office armory and laboratory which are crucial locations in the game that must be stuffed by a ghost. Uh, as you can see, they are docile, uh, they are stationary, they need to stick close to their office. Uh, they may exit, but uh, like they, they don't uh, wander around. Uh, this, is, uh, this is meant to make it easier for participants as if they once localized the laboratory, they know where it is and uh, localizing stuff and pinning it on the maps is a part of the gameplay as well. They must be found and communicated with. Uh, and so they are, as I stated before, uh, uh, AIs of higher sort, uh, holographic projections, what have you. What, what makes your tickle pickle, as they say. Uh, so uh, anyways, let's go on. Squads will have specialties. And this time, these specialties, every squad will consist of three people. And every, it is very important that they are three people in the squad. And every person in the squad will have their own specialty, uh, which will be important for the game flow. And uh, some, um, like this will be really, really self-explanatory once I tell you, but bear in mind that uh, organization of the squads is something that you can have an, a hands-on approach, like you can decide who goes where, but it is also cool if they are allowed to uh, grab themselves into three-man squad. So th th this time, it's not like in the key of Whisper Steel where it is really necessary that they are mixed and blah, blah, blah. Here, everything goes. This game was uh, made uh, as easily accessible for participants as I could make it. Because the game will be hard. I don't want to make anything harder than actual challenges that will be within the game. So there will be leader, self-explanatory uh, pretty much, uh, communication specialist, which is comms for short, and technician. Okay, and the artifacts. In the game, there will be a lot of stuff scattered around. And one of the greater challenges, I've, in my opinion, the greatest challenges of organizing this game is actually preparing the space for the game. Uh, of course, several games may be replayed then in this prepared space, but anytime the maintenance of the space uh, took, takes a lot of time and uh, workforce. So there are oxygen markers and med kits marker, med kit markers, which are the resources I've been sp speaking about, which can go away if you decide that this is too much. There are general data template dossier uh, of delegates for the sectors template, scraps of memoirs template, and reports template. It doesn't matter what will be on them. I will show you uh, in the design document how, how does it look. <sighs> okay, do you see it? 
Great. So I will uh, slide down, of course, if my computer allows me. Uh, wait, what? <gasps> oh, no. Uh, this is not the thing. Uh, this is not the webinar I wanted to tell to show you. Okay, so I will find it and I will show you things uh, after after the break because I can uh, like we will work with the document then because I have prepared the uh, wrong. Uh, I have opened mistakenly by mistake the online uh, document. Never mind. But just I will tell tell you more about these, but. To, to make long story short, the things that are on them are irrelevant. What is relevant is that they are all inscribed with a, uh, with a few letters from the cipher, from the code they will be trying to break. So they will be trying to gather these uh, to get the entire message, which will be uh, encrypted. And every single type is another message. So general data template, this is one type. So one on, on all the items from this uh, section, there will be collectively one message, okay? Dossiers of delegates of the sectors template, this will be a different message. There will be multiple of these types, these items, but they have four groups and if you get all the items from that group, you have a complete message, message which you can then translate. Is that clear? Because I don't know if I, I, I see. Okay. Uh, now, my favorite starting point. The players must know that they are uh, Ariadna troops. What are Ariadna troops? You decide. If you want to build more hype around it. If you want them to feel more um, valiant about this, uh, you can give any story to it as you wish. What I personally like to do with things like this is to set uh, the... Because I have not specified where this game takes place, what country, what area. I like to tell kids that uh, their favorite local group transformed into Elysium. For example, that we are the ones that were able to survive and now we are the Elysium. Uh, that the, the sense of continuity in my work usually is very important. Uh, and I give it to you as an example of what you can do with this fact. They are divided in three men squads bonded by experience and Ariadna system. In this game, their bonding will be very important because in the online game, we can imagine stuff. But here, I wanted to make sure that the squads are as close to each other as humanly possible. That's why they will be bonded by a rope. They will be, there will be ropes connecting every participant of the squad to each other. And they will have to go over, uh, over uh, terrain obstacles, uh, uh, sneak around, uh, run from the ghouls and stuff like that. Everything whilst being joined by the rope. So this is those, as I said before, uh, inconveniences that they will have to overcome. This is a great inconvenience. This is really makes it far harder than you might think to have to actually conduct under pressure situation, under pressure task, while being tugged constantly by someone. Uh, they will have to find a way to feel good about it. They will have to find a way to coordinate their actions, their moves, uh, and technically, if they, uh, if they make it, they will uh, be able to make an advantage out of it. I see that somebody written down something on the chat, so I can take it one uh, right now. Uh, 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 feedback on the rope mechanic. Uh, let me first please uh, um, 
tell you how it must be implemented, how to do it safely, okay? Because safety is a concern while doing this. Uh, and then I will tell you my uh, experiences with using this uh, technique. Uh, in the um, in the section, uh, in the appropriate section, I will uh, I will speak about this. So uh, they know they have a limited time to find the database, and they need to investigate the ruined facility, avoiding hostile ghouls, and reach all the ghosts that can grant them access to the database. So what I'd like them to know up front is complete extent of their challenge because. Uh, in such a game where there, are, there may be so much confusion, there's so many things to see, there's so many things to go wrong, they should at least be clear of purpose. They should uh, at least know exactly what they should do. Find all the ghosts, learn from them how to get the database, don't get killed, get the database. As simple as that, in and out. Everything else will be hard. Uh, so no need for confusion and secrecy here. So this is the starting point. Uh, okay. Disclaimer. Uh, as you can see, this is a very uh, elaborated disclaimer. The game is designed to be played with four to five squads or three participants. You can go higher than that. If you decide to... Uh, if you have the space, because the space is an issue, uh, and if you have more people to stuff the game with, you can go higher. You uh, technically can go lower, uh, as seen here, by adding more squads up to 21 participants in total, yes, uh, or by reducing the amount of people in a squad to two participants. Not recommended, but it is possible. Okay, so you can have two people in one squad. More on that later. Uh, you can also reduce the amount of squads to three. So the game goes from nine participants up to 21 participants. Uh, but yes, you can go even higher uh, if you have more stuff and more space. Um, generally, if you're not confident about yourself uh, as an organizer yet, if you're not confident about your staff or you're not confident about your participants, the lower the, no the number, the better. The, the, the less people playing this game, the more controllable it is. And uh, this, uh, there is no way to conduct this game flawlessly first time. Like... It can be serviceable, but you will see that you need to get a grip on it uh, with time. With uh, And I think it's understandable that you gain knowledge and uh, as you practice. So uh, the game is made in such a way that NPC's role uh, can be given to a second different set of participants thus raising the maximum amount of participants involved up to 30 people. So you can, if you have another different uh, group of participants, they will have fun as well you doing the NPC role. Participants acting as NPCs must be properly trained beforehand, and it is recommended that the game organizer has some established previous relationship with them. What I love to do with this type of games is to have a older group of participants and younger group of participants and to make them interact in this game. Older participants act as NPCs. Younger participants are the main uh, creatures scurrying around uh, in, the, in, in doing the bulk of the game. Both groups will be educated both groups will gain uh, experience and knowledge. And the game is made in such a way that both groups will have fun because playing as a ghoul will be fun for a person playing as a ghoul. Playing as a ghost is also uh, fun. Mm, another question. Eh, this is a very, very uh, specific question. 
Uh, okay, I, I can take it now. Um, so the question is, if we have 10 participants, how do we divide the squads? Uh, I suggest in this situation, make five squads of two. Actually, the game will be a little easier, but five squads of two make sense in this situation. Uh, unless you want to assign some people as NPCs to the game. Uh, no problem. It's already, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so... So, so, so. Yes, the previous relationship is important as you need them. You, you need to know that they will do their job right. And another disclaimer, and this is a game of disclaimers. The game is supposed to be a fast-paced, uh, challenging experience where, fa uh, well, where failure is not only possible, but very likely. This is seriously. You, you can... Uh, tell your participants that this game will be hard for them. Uh, however, you may make it easier for your participants depending on their and your proficiency in this kind of games. Hints on how to uh, do it will be provided accordingly. I have already told you, for example, about the resources and about the number of players, but I will give you more. But bear in mind that fast pace is what this game should be. As you can see, the briefing uh, consists of several elements. Uh, that's why you sometimes will, if, for example, you have less trust in cap mental capacities of your participants, you should, uh, for example, give them the ability to brief themselves earlier, but I will speak about this in the preparation for the game, uh, because they will uh, need to understand the rules and they should be asked at least twice if everything is understood with specific uh, questions in mind. Uh, so everything here to make it easier for you is in the design document. In At the end of the document, oh, wait, uh, before I go to the briefing, here are the uh, items they will be looking for. So, as you can see, scraps of memoirs, and here's it's like a sheet from uh, from documents. Uh, I have provided them with uh, like this narrative element, but uh, as you will find out, uh, you will have a blank version of it as well. So you will have a uh, my proposal and the blank version, if you decide, for example, that in the memoirs, you want to tell your own story. So you can put it here and the story will emerge uh, from these memoirs. Initially, I have created an entire story for them, but uh, that was scrapped alongside the way. But uh, every single uh, element, here is in this blank version and how I Im imagine using them, the elements of the code should be written here and they will be written down with a luminescent marker, UV marker, so that when participants find it, they can shine UV light on it and that way it will be revealed. The UV light will also have other uh, uses in the game, but uh, but that's generally the idea with the artifacts they will be scouting for. Uh, but here, uh, as you can see, every single person, every every role has their briefing, and the briefings are immensely detailed. They possess every single tidbit of knowledge that this person needs to carry out their role. And the same goes for the squads. Squad primer. You receive in the squad primer elements, uh, the knowledge that is required of participants to play the game. You can disseminate squad primers ahead of the game. As there is no secrecy between the squads, 
there is no problem with them sharing this, speaking about it, asking you questions. That's why, as always, I will advise to have a Facebook group before the game to hype them up, to answer the questions, to prepare them, disseminate the, the materials. Uh, and uh, so the squad primer here is about the technical issues of the roles uh, within the group, within the squad. And here is uh, the briefing, the narrative briefing, what goes on and main objective, secondary objectives and standard equipment. So here you can see uh, the elements that each squad will have. And you can add whatever you wish to this, uh, but more on that later. Of course, you have the schedule. Uh, so let's get back to the presentation. Introduction may, everything here actually can be uh, introduction, rules, squads, uh, and squad details. Everything here can be done remotely up front uh, a day, uh, two days, or a week before the game, and only recapped during the game. Because I found this works far better if at the day of the game, participants can start role playing immediately. Like they go into the game, they go into their characters, and the uh, fun begins. Knots. This is another thing uh, which I will show you in the design document. Uh, there is an entire section, safety advice. Entirety of this section is here so that nobody uh, harms themselves in any way. And also this is uh, the thing that I was asked about previously, about the feedback about the ropes. Here I have uh, inbuilt everything uh, from every run of the game, uh, similar games previously. Here are the knots that are needed to create harnesses because what is dangerous with the ropes, and this is the main danger using them, is that if an untrained person ties something on their waist and another person pulls, it can, it can get tightened. And then it is not only painful, but dangerous. If you uh, create a single harness using this knot, handcuff knot, it will never tighten. It is impossible for the, uh, for the rope to tighten here. And if you join every harness using bowline knot, then whatever happens to the main rope connecting them will not affect uh, the harness at all. Like, of course, if you pull, uh, the person will feel the pull, but it will not interact with the with the knots in any way these knots will create separate entities and of course bowline knot is uh, far easier to tie so you can prepare upfront harnesses using handcuff knots and then teach your participants or teach one of the staff members hq uh, has this element in their requirements that they need to know how to tie these knots. So one of the HQ uh, members can be a specialist of bowline knots. So there's that. And if you read this section, uh, you will find absolutely everything I could imagine that may pose uh, a threat uh, or a problem for the game. Uh, and I have pointed it out to, to make you not forget about it while preparing the, the experience. So I hope this answers the question. Uh, tasks. To the tasks, we go in a second. But general structure of the game is that every uh, the game will consist of excursions because participants will go into the darkness and then they will return to the HQ. 
uh, I will call their going into the darkness as, as excursions. So first, there is a cohesion and system check. What I mean by this? Mm, I imagine this to be like a drill before the main game begins. Well, it technically is a part of the game and participants should treat it as a part of the game, but this is like uh, fast gearing up into your, uh, your gear, uh, organizing into the ranks uh, in order that you will be leaving HQ and then uh, going into the dark. So you can test their efficiency. This is the moment when you can see if they understand the technical aspect of their gear. So you can ask, do you have your cell phone on? Yes. Do you have your flashlights? Yes. Do you have your knots? Change, checking knots. And you can do this thing that I, I, I love to do it. You may know that paratroopers, before they exit the, the plane, they have last check of their parachutes. They stand in a row and they check their parachutes. So what you can do is to put all your squads in a row and the previous squad checks the other squad uh, knots if they are tied properly. It's not to assume that they didn't, it's just there to make this vibe, oh, we're tactical squads, we need to make a system check and stuff like that. The more immersive elements like this you will put in, the better. Initial reconnaissance has these objectives. You should try to find ghosts if it is at all possible. You should try to avoid, avoid ghouls, but here the ghouls are specified in their briefing that they should be not very active. They, would ra they will be rather there to make the creep factor, if at all, because the the person uh, the, the the participants need to get the first feel of the situation because it is really uneasy to walk in the complete darkness and uh, decontamination procedure check if uh, if you decide to do it uh, it is optional uh, and decontamination procedure check is enlarged described in the design document i won't be uh, using too much time on it right now, as this is an advanced rule, but you can look it up and decide whether you want it in your game or not. Okay, so then we have, uh, after the first incursion, there is a first assessment and council. Uh, so if you decide that to have decontamination, we start with decontamination as they return from the from the excursion and need to de remove the gear and decontaminate themselves. Uh, as we're in the age of COVID, uh, you may want them to actually decontaminate using uh, everything that uh, they would any otherwise do at this point. Uh, masks are also very cool here, so they, they even should be wearing masks. They are in a dangerous place. Uh, so, one person in the, uh, uh, in the HQ staff uh, re regains spent oxygen bottles. It is assumed that one oxygen bottle, meaning the one token of, of oxygen, lasts 15 minutes. If a person, if, if a squad isn't able for whatever reason to return in 15 minutes, they are assumed dead. So if they, but however, if they manage to return even after three minutes, the oxygen is, exp is uh, extracted from them anyways. So one excursion, one, one oxygen. Uh, technician mark objectives on the maps. So instantly there is this division of roles because technicians will instantly go to the table where there is the grand map of the, of the entire uh, facility and they will mark what they found. Oh, here I found a ghoul, uh, something, something moved here. There might be ghouls here. Oh, I we found this. We found a few markers here. I don't know what it is. It may be trash, but we might, you might want to see it. But we found laboratory. We know where laboratory is. And you understand they are, working with the map and 
technicians have their own like close relationship as they're trying to prepare com uh, comprehensive view of the situation. Now, at the same time, com, uh, com specialists, communication specialists, upload finding, uh, findings into mainframe. So, what do I mean by this? They take their cell phones and they plug it into the, into the computer. You can have several computers if you wish, or I advise having like this uh, box that allows you to uh, plug multiple wires into it because they download the video from this excursion to the computer to make a video log of every excursion. This is what I was talking about, that they will be filming themselves. And this is, there are two ways of doing this, actually. You may either decide on the initial idea of mine that they will be just walking around with, with their cell phone or with a selfie stick or with a selfie harness. It's all so cool if you have this helm that, uh, but uh, these are of course expenditures, Never mind. Uh, I was lucky to have these. Anyways, uh, so they're working with their cell phone and they're recording uh, as they go, or they are uh, streaming their excursion. But this is very, uh, the first option with recording is the easier one. The streaming version requires another staff member to be in charge of this uh, streaming process. Like he sits in the HQ and he views all the streams and records them or whatnot. It is very cool because this person has like this monitor of, uh, of monitors and a picture of this looks very professional, but it is harder to um, prepare. I'm just putting it here as an extended option. So, and at the same time as technicians, as com, uh, comms upload uh, the videos, uh, leaders coordinate the strategy. So they have their few minutes to conv con converse about what happened and what's going on. And then they go to the map and on the map, technicians set everything. If there's something uh, witnessed in the excursion, like video that one of the communication specialists want to show because it's important, it's relevant, they can show it at this point as they are all already downloaded. And there's this, this vibe of actual military or scientific expedition where every single person is involved in some kind of activity which is necessary to the benefit of all. And among the leaders, eventually there will arise a leader, like leader of leaders, a person that will naturally coordinate them. If this is not the case, then the game will be harder. And then we have the second excursion. And at this point, they can pick things up. So they have been scouting, but now they can pick things up, collect, items, they can go uh, and try to do challenges because if they know where ghosts are, they can interact with ghosts and make their challenges. Uh, ghouls instantly become more aggressive. And here's the thing. There are only three ghosts and there are five teams. So what's up? It should, it's so easy. Not really, because some squads will be occupied by uh, taunting the ghouls and luring them away from the objectives. And this is what something that participants must figure out. That there must be a, this, this uh, because the ghouls will be informed where the ghosts are and naturally ghouls will try to like uh, ambush uh, participants near these areas where the ghosts are. Uh, so they must be lured away in order for participants to enter uh, to the laboratory or records office or, or what have you. Uh, so from this point on, 
It is advised that the players stick to the pattern of excursions, followed by assessment and counsel. It is advised, but it may all break down if, uh, if necessary. But as they gather more intel and also are attacked by ghouls, their cohesion might break. This is something that I told you before. Uh, they may decide on utterly different approaches to tasks with every gameplay. So, uh, by the way, this game is replayable. Even if you replay play this game once, you can play it again. And this is very uh, this is very cool because you can always get better at uh, what you're doing in this game. And foreknowledge is not a problem. It's something, if you fail the game once, you can tell to your persistent participants, well, I hope that you've learned something. Let's try again, because that's what brave people do. Uh, however, uh, they should have last counsel before the curtain call, which occurs 15 minutes before the end of the game. So whatever happens, they have the curtain call narrowly before the end of the game, to give them last chance of finishing the story. There, the entire story is as in uh, as in uh, Uncharted, written down in briefings for ghouls, for uh, ghosts. They have this interlocking pattern of challenges that um, that creates the story, and you need to unlock things as you go to progress in the story. And more on the, the briefing later. We are in the rules section. Uh, however, at this point, before I start with the rules themselves, uh, I wish to speak a little bit about the area of the game. The area is very clearly specified in the design document, but I want to make an exclaimer here. Disclaimer here. Uh, I recommend playing this game in the building because buildings have a tendency to have less elements that are potentially dangerous to participants. And by design, they have narrow corridors, stairwells, and things like that. Second thing. I advise to have completely zero lighting in the building. It might be, uh, it might sound like it's dangerous, and to an extent it is, because falling off the stairs will hurt a person. But what I found from my work with my participants from nearly a decade of active uh, organizing games for the youth, if they feel that this is real, they will treat it as real. They will not mess around. From the start, they will, whoa, it is really dark in here. I really need to watch my step. Uh, this creates a situation of real tension, of real tangible uh, challenge, real tangible adventure with which they will be interacting. So, uh, usually what I've been doing is I've been finding a school and speaking to the director and asking if on Saturday, on Sunday, uh, we may at the evening, like on the Sunday morning, can we go in and prepare the game? In the evening, we will play and next day we will take everything away. So if, if it's okay to play a game during weekend. And most of the time it was, it was fine. Okay, so now the rules. Uh, everything is of course uh, explained in the design document what I, okay, we have a question and I think I can uh, okay. If you have squads of three, those three people are tied with the rope. So you have five separate squads, which 
inside, internally of the squad are tied by a rope. Okay, so here is uh, everything, but uh, these are the squad badges. And the squad badges are created in such a way because if the players will be using UV flashlights, this will immediately uh, show them that they are flashing a light on a person from their expedition, not on the ghoul or the ghost. So they will really make a functional purpose of, rec of, of, of recognizing each other in the dark. So that's why they are uh, uh, a separate uh, entity here. Uh, and going back to the presentation. <sighs> Wait, sorry. Okay, so first the bonding. I have spoken about this uh, bonding of the squad members. I have spoken about this previously. Uh, the length of the rope that you choose is very uh, impactful on the game itself. What I found is that having three meters of rope between a person is fine. You don't have to write this down in any capacity because I have uh, written down specifications in the manual, but uh, also the, the, the thicker the rope, the better because it will not uh, in any capacity uh, be able to do any harm. Uh, also, harnesses. If you put a harness here, like on the chest, there is always a rib cage inside that may get bruised but won't get hurt. What people usually do is they are putting harnesses in the waist as this is like intuitive, but it, it is cool if you have a like professional harness. Um, otherwise, uh, you should uh, consider putting them uh, on the on the on the chest, and uh, with with those knots you can tie them. Uh, at any capacity, any any type of participant. But it is really to your, uh, like your, your discretion is advised here. Uh, only you know how your participants look like and where the, uh, where the harnesses will be most appropriate. Although uh, the chest is always better than, uh, than the waist, but it must be uh, really looked out for that nothing is even nearly uh, close to the to the uh, neck of a participant. So the squad roles, uh, I have explained them, but uh, I will uh, give them more love right now. I really, oh, no, wait. By the way, I really love these graphics. I, I really do. There's something about them that makes me want to look at them. So uh, if we are back to the uh, squad primer, then here every, uh, every, uh, every role is described. So squad leader coordinates with HQ, responds to directives, gather the artifacts, and so and so. I would like you right now, is it... Uh, can, is it uh, clearly readable from your perspective? Can you read it from your screen? So I would like you to read it right now because it's just a few lines of text and tell me what is unclear, if there is something that is unclear.
If there are any questions, please either speak or write them in the comment section. Because this is exactly what your participants will receive. So if there is something unclear, something that you don't understand, then they won't understand it either and somebody will have to explain them. So uh, everything's good, yes? Hanya is trying to get through. I don't hear you, yes? No, I'm just giving some comments. Okay. So I don't see any comments. Therefore, I believe everything is clear. That's great because this is the core of the game. If they understand this, everything onwards will be easier. Everything, you can drop most of the things in the game. If this is what's going on and they will be doing this in darkness, they will have a lot of fun. You can change the challenges, you can change the ghoul mechanics, you can change pretty much everything. But if they will be binded by the rope and in the darkness and doing these objectives, they will have tremendous fun. They will feel like real operatives on the mission. And all the magic will happen between them, even before the debriefing, as they will try, first of all, to get along in their teams and then coordinate the efforts of every team to an, go to a goal that is in the end of the game, to, to, his, to the goal that is the end of the game. Yes. So there. Mm. So this, these, are the, uh, these are the roles. Here are the resources. How does a resource work? A resource works like this. If you want to go out, you need this. You need an oxygen bottle. Straightforward. When a group runs out of oxygen bottles, they may no longer leave. Uh, they have some, this is specified in their, in their, uh, in their primer, how many do they have at start? I believe it's two. They can get more because if they do a challenge in the armory, they will get more, more oxygen to be to, to go carry on with the game. But other than that, they may find some oxygen in the field. So this is another element uh, that they can look for. And how does uh, ah, by the way, they can, of course, exchange oxygen between squads. This is a part of the strategy because, as I said before, they may, there may be a situation where they found a lot of pieces of paper with cipher on it and somebody needs to decipher it. So, for example, one squad may decide that they stay put in the HQ and try to break the cipher while other, others try to coordinate and get more pieces of it. Uh, I, I cannot understand, uh, understate how fun things happen, how, how much cool decision-making processes you can witness playing this game anytime. They, 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 they will, it will be like this little hive of bees that everyone has something to do. And if somebody doesn't have something to do, it's because there is a problem. That's, that's, something, that's something completely separate from the game. There, you may notice a person that is not engaged. There's, there is where you as a facilitator walk in. Your only role during the game, if your staff is briefed properly, if the HQ staff and the ghouls and the ghosts, everyone is briefed properly, it's on, on completely hands-off. You don't have to do anything the films will be making themselves the map will be updating themselves uh, itself everything will go by its own your role is only to make sure that everyone knows what's going on is engaged if there are some quarrels between people you try to settle them you act as this i don't know you can make yourself a a, a, a person a, like this end character you're a major or or a captain or something like this and you're or or chaplain i don't know what's what's the style you want to go with but 
you're this person that settles elements. And by the way, you can have awesome fun as well with this. I always did. Okay, so. Uh, okay, actual props. This is a great question. I've been given, uh, I've, I've received a question that uh, resources uh, are represented by these tokens. Uh, what about actual props? Absolutely cool. If you are able to make these props in uh, enough amount and uh, that they are really uh, visible as what they represent, like you initially know that this is a medkit or something, that's great. On one uh, summer camp with my scouts, we took some boards or some planks, we cut them into pieces and we sprayed them so that they were, for the first look, indistinguishable from the medical first aid kits. And we had like a hundred of them. There was mass production of, of medical kits. It's, it's, the preparation for this game can be fun by themselves, uh, by itself. Mm. So now, how does a first aid kit work? To that, I need to uh, like inform you how the ghouls work. I will be speaking more about them later, but you need to understand how people can die. It's pretty easy. The ghouls have like three modes of operations. If they are able to see you, they will, if there's a sound that you make or they see a light, they will slowly shamble towards the source of this light or uh, sound. If somebody uh, puts light straight on them or makes a really loud sound, they are instantly agitated. This is their second pattern. They will be rushing towards a team. They will not be sprinting because they will outrun the team, obviously, but theirs not to catch them actually is to make them, you know, Crap their pants. They need to be chased, not catch, cut, caught, yes? But if there is a situation where a ghoul eventually grabs any person of the team, at this point, the ghoul says, game stop. Ghoul leaves his role. People in the game must leave his role, their role, like in the squad. They have been killed. And from now on, Ghoul escorts them to the HQ. He's for a second not a Ghoul. It would be appropriate if the Ghouls have something that distinguishes a situation where I thought they're not playing. In my games, uh, I usually make that people that are not currently playing are walking like this, like a chieftain of a Indian tribe. And everyone that's walking like this is not currently a member of the game. He's not, he's invisible. He's not in the world. So they are, the ghoul and the team walk like this to the uh, um, HQ and the ghoul informs they're dead. I've caught them and leaves them there. And now a person in the HQ asks, do you have a med kit? If you have a med kit, you can instantly go back. You give me your med kit and the amount of oxygen, the time that you wasted is wasted. But if you have some more, you can still go on. If not, then you stay here. And only when the next team will be exiting, you may exit as well. Is it clear? So this is, med kids are like get out of jail free card. So now we're in the, we're in the ghouls territory. I've been speaking about three patterns. So the ghoul may be shambling towards participants, rushing towards participants, or being technically out of the game uh, it, I, I put this in place because people, if there is no, no such uh, clear uh, call that game stop, uh, people are 
struggling. They're fighting for their lives. They're immersed in to such a degree that they don't understand that this is a game. They try to run and then awful things happen with, in which one person is called, uh, two people are rushing, uh, mayhem, complete mayhem. Uh, there were attacks on the ghouls. There was there was a very very fun situation in which like this little girl, 14 years of age, she was like 140 centimeters. She actually lashed out and start beating uh, a guy uh, like 180. Yes, because he was a ghoul and she was. So so yeah, and and she scratched his face, and like there was real injuries, but not a part of the participant. But the poor goal was have been taken away. Anywho, uh, so the goals, the goals should be wise. Uh, the goals should have communication with themselves, and goals are responsible for making events events in the game because. There may be, for example, a situation where the ghouls do not uh, and stuff, do not do not moan and, and shamble audibly, but make a trap. If they know that participants walk always through the same route, they may stand there in complete darkness, unmoving and un unreveal themselves only when they are surrounding, for example, one of the squads. And it's okay. It's not unfair. This is to make a to create this aura of real danger, of real uh, thinking opponent that is actively hunting us. It works wonders. If the, so, the so ghouls may be for a time inactive, and participants will be like, "Whoa, where are they?" They will be cautious and slow because they won't be knowing where the ghouls are. So the ghouls may have made them sit for a second, grab some tea or, or some water and with hushed voices analyze, okay, so I make an ambush here and you make an ambush here. You, you, you basically get the drift. So the ghouls also will be having fun, but what must be uh, described with capital letters to the ghouls is that they are there to make it fun for the participants. The, it, they should be having fun themselves. But if participants visually lure them away, they must be fooled. So if participants do hey, pst, hey, pst, and like do these little movements of flashlight, so the ghoul must interact with it, must go in the direction of the of the of the of the bait, and participants may not attack the ghouls. So the ghouls are there just; they should be safe. Uh, participants have no technical ways of fighting the ghouls. They may only trick them. Uh, if you have more bellicose uh, or warlike participants, this is something that should be brought up that no, you do not fight your adversaries. You try to outthink them, uh, outmaneuver them. And the ghouls Martin, will be always, yes? Because we have 25 minutes still. Yes. So maybe we can switch to the modes that you speak uh, less and then ask questions if everything is... Uh, <laughs> If everything yes, and I believe I have a question. Oh yeah, for everyone. actually, <laughs> good point. I'm lost, <laughs> said Muhammad. So please uh, say where are you lost in, and maybe Martin, you should not yes it so much. So very straightforward. Sorry, because we just have little time now. Yes, okay. Where are you lost? The best is if you tell me in person. Yeah, or... come up and speak. What is the with which part are you lost? Hello, everyone. Hello. Actually, in many parts, I was lost because uh, there is some details. There is so much details that you can't catch them just with talking, you know? Yes, I understand. Yeah. But uh, is there yeah. something that I would like you to, uh, would like me to uh, explain? Like in what some part? Uh, 
Actually, generally, it's clear, but there is some details in the in the game. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you can't. Uh, you should play the game to to really yes. catch them. You know, I am. Like, I, I, I am sure that I will. Mm -hmm. I guarantee that if you read the manual, if you read the design document, and even then rehear what I'm saying here, everything will be far clearer to you. I'm. I'm. Uh, I, I am certain of this. And as for Sabrina, uh, Sabina, sorry, uh, the the big picture, the scheme of activity, um, I was really trying to break my head around this. How should I create like this flowchart of activities or a scheme? And unfortunately, I wasn't able to think of something compact because in this game, everything is everywhere. But I will try to, in the most uh, basic terms, explain things on the uh, uh, on this uh, on the on the map. Okay, can I? I will use the map that I uh, have here from the online version, and I will try to show you on this map how things go. So imagine that this here is our HQ. This is the headquarters of the game. Participants will be here and will have tea, coffee, or what have you, like sweets, or maybe you understand, you can call them rations or whatever. The important part of the HQ is this, which we imagine is a table with a map. And on this map, they will have the map of entire game, everything. And also there is a computer to which they will upload the videos that they are making whilst they are moving through here and recording everything. So this is a focal point of the game, the most important one. Secondary, let's imagine, because in this game there are three locations, let's imagine that here is a laboratory, laboratory here is an armory, and here is the records office. It doesn't make any sense, but whatever. It's here. The game begins when participants put on their robes and slowly move away using all available access points and passages and just trying to get the vibe of the environment, to know what's going on and where. It's completely dark, they have their flashlights, but wait, one of the squads noticed that somebody is in the darkness. And this somebody in the darkness may be either a ghost or a ghoul. A ghost is a positive occurrence, he's a, or her, uh, she's a, a important person to which they must speak. So, for example, a team went all the way here and here's a person. Oh, it's a ghost. Great. It's a ghost of records office. Cool. But they meet somebody here, for example, and that's not a ghost. It's a ghoul. And this ghoul starts to go at them. And if he is able to touch them, they are dead. And I've been explaining how does it work. And entirety of the game works in this fashion. They exit this place, try to find something. For example, Ghost of Records office tells them that they need this. They need the password from the, from the memoirs, for example. And they need to get the entire password. Uh, and so on and so forth. The entirety of the game is squads trying to trick the ghouls so as the ghouls don't kill them and meet the ghosts and find the things that the ghost would like them to find. This is the entirety. I think somebody... Uh, okay. uh, so uh, can they reach other troops videos into... Uh, uh, yes, of course. Yes, of course. Uh, they, they can uh, exchange information. The game is all about exchanging information. So they can see what other people saw during their expeditions. So, for example, they may do expeditions in turn. So, for example, one uh, group goes or two group goes, two groups wait. 
two group goes, two groups wait, and they exchange information in this manner. Marty. They can imagine any way to play the game. Yes? Okay, and the next question. Tanya? The next question of Balint is also, maybe you missed, that one detail is not clear. What can the participants do once a goal spots a squad? Just staying quiet and turning the phone. Oh, that, that, Shall they actively run as well or just stay in the dark? This is an excellent question. Thank you for it because I have over, uh, I have skipped over it. They have several modes of operation. If the ghoul is simply shambling in their direction, so he noticed them but is not aggravated, they can uh, turn off the lights and stay quiet. And then the ghoul may even pass at arm's length from them. And if they do not move and not make a sound, the ghoul will ignore them. And this is the cool part of the game when you're standing absolutely motionless when this creature is moving uh, beside you. Of course, they can aggravate the ghoul, shining the light on him or make another sound. So the ghoul follows them and they can follow him. They can lead him to somewhere. He is not a problem for other teams. But also, uh, if they uh, aggravate ghoul, if the ghoul is already rah, charging at them, they may run. They must run. They need to run and fight the place where there is uh, where they uh, can hide. Basically, like it is assumed that the ghoul is not very bright. Like they can assume that those creatures are rather dumb. So if they take a sharp corner and there is like an alcove in which they can hide, they hide, they're motionless, the ghoul goes away. And that's all. So, and this is the this is scream of the game. The, the interactions between the participants and the ghouls Will I guess I can I can I can uh, I can bet the remnants of my beard on it that this will be the most memorable element of the game for them. Okay, thank so you. So there, we have fifteen minutes. Thank you for this question. Back to the mm -hmm. structure to the. Okay. Yes, yes, I'm going. I'm going. Uh, I'm I'm rushing. Uh, bah, 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 bah. The briefing rules, bonding rules, resources, opposing forces. The contamination we will skip over as this is described in the manual and it's an additional rule. And the tasks. Okay, so in the HQ, all the tasks are completely explained in the manual. So this is what I've been showing to you previously. Uh, the command staff of the recon unit briefing, yes. Uh, they, they possess all the tasks here. They have their tasks. Squads have their tasks. The ghost of the records office has his tasks or her tasks. So the tasks are pretty easy. I wanted to uh, speak more about these uh, in this section. I even have those cool, uh, uh, cool, 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 uh, pictures, but I will speak about one uh, because everything else you will be able to just read. If you go word by word, follow the idea, this will be the game, like the um, blah, 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 the structure of the narrative, the story, and also the challenges within. But there are, uh, there is one important challenge that I want to just state here before we go on. The Caesar cipher. If you don't know what is a Caesar cipher, I have put it in several places in the design document. Basically, it's a type of cipher where you uh, substitute one letter with another letter, and there is always, always the same shift. So for example, if I had uh, a shift two, that would be C because Yes, there's A, B, and C. So I moved two letters. So I would, I wanted to write down A, but I write down C. This is simple. But the, those ciphers here are, there are four different passwords and they are mm, from easy, from like way, way easy, like childish up to very hard. If the, that's why, participants might have troubles uh, working with it. Bear this in mind that there is there. 
And this is important in the game. Uh, one more thing that I need to show you and I need to tell you is the obstacles, because this is something that you can skip. You don't have to have it in your game. But I must uh, notice that there are uh, obstacles in the game uh, that oh, tripwire terrain obstacles. These are elements that you build inside your game area. You create them with furniture or, or card boxes or wood, what have you. I have given descriptions of these and they are fun and safe to play with because I have also given the safety advice how to use them. And they are a lot, a lot of fun. But if you decide that your game is already hard enough and are already complicated, this is an, an additional element. And now we can move on to the technical preparation. So you know this screen by now. Choose a place to organize the game, preferably five to six weeks prior. Choose actors that will reenact NPCs in the game and train them. Whether you uh, decide these are your participants as well, or those will be uh, hired people, no problem whatsoever. This game can be played with one adult and rest of all our participants. So there's that. Uh, you decide, but preferably a month prior. You need to make sure that they know what to do and you trust them. Then inform the players about the game. The Facebook group is always on plus. Uh, print materials. Uh, and prepare the items. Uh, so, and remind your players about the situation. Uh, and uh, this is like before, a day before you try to remind them, hey, we're playing tomorrow. And prepare, uh, prepare the game er area, preferably the same day as if you build stuff in the school, they won't like it very much to stand there for a long time. So yeah, and this is what you can do with your participants. If you, for example, have mm, like nine people as your NPCs and they are participants as well, they are your kids, use them to build structures. Uh, that's, that's how I do it. That's how I made it to achieve this game. Uh, all actually. Preparation here is the technical issues, like building the stuff inside the game and choosing the spot, everything else. Well, this game is pretty easy. The challenges are pretty easy. Notion is pretty easy. You need to have a well-trained group of uh, HQ people and everything will be cool. And the briefing for the game. Maybe pretty usual. Wait a second. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions to preparations for the game? Okay. Yes, actually I have a question, sorry. Uh, yeah. I, I feel that there is like one kind of like a weak point of safety if we combine running uh, ropes and obstacles in the darkness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> it's not that's a question. Why, I have, why the, that's... Let's, let's just hear me out. Um, What's your suggestion to to tackle that? Yeah, uh, I have really found found out that kids are really effective at keep, keeping them safe themselves safe if they have a feeling that they should watch out. They are danger for themselves when they are certain that they are safe. Then bad things happen. I've done this game with the obstacles running and ropes and there was no real problem. People were maybe falling sometimes and there were some bruises, but basically nobody got hurt. Was I lucky? I don't know. It was a several, several runs of the game, but you can eliminate uh, obstacles or build them from materials that are safe. Even like these great pillows 
with 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 uh, I don't know what they have inside, but you can you can throw a lot of uh, card boxes and pillows, and this will be already an obstacle that in the darkness will pose a challenge for them because if they make noise, uh, they will attract ghouls. So that's that. Uh, you uh, the amount of danger while running increases as the ghouls are more and more scary. So the panic is the worst thing that can happen. So you can, for example, eliminate this aspect completely. You can tell participants, ghouls that they never run. Like you can never run at participants. The participants may run by their own accord if they are freaked out, but if the ghoul does not chase them, there's less of a chance for a panic. And the other thing uh, that I would uh, recommend, but it's something uh, like if you're not certain about safety, you can leave uh, elements of light in tactical spots, like, for example, stairwells. So in the places where there is the most potential danger, you can leave light, but you can do it in a climactic way, in the way that it is cool, not like just turn the light on, but you can, for example, tape a flashlight to the ground so it does give light, but it looks like a, uh, like a flashlight covered in some mucus left from the other team. Yeah, so things like that. Or you can, for example, uh, if, if, uh, there are those la la lanterns uh, which look like this uh, old lanterns. You can put that lantern in some place to make it like wiggle. Uh, th these are, there are more, many p p ways to attract this. I hope that I have answered your question. Cool? Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other Great. preparation to the game? Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Great. So, this time we are back to the basic structure of my debriefing, but debriefing in this game is less of a strenuous experience. This game is really mostly about fun. So if you start with hyping with them, you, I suppose, can waste entire hour hyping about everything and speaking about every single detail. Of course, I provide some questions for you because it's always cool to ask them what was the toughest thing? What was the hardest part? What Were, were you afraid of the ghouls or the, the, the obstacles or the darkness or what? The cipher maybe? Uh, the challenges of the ghosts? What was the hardest part? When you go to the feedback, it is good to uh, remember that at this point, you are uh, supposed to give them feedback of their performance. It's if they screwed up and they failed completely, they weren't able to manage to get the final jackpot. You can tell it to them and you can show them where have they failed. And you can Ask them why did you uh, what what made uh, what what uh, led to this situation? What happened in your team? What happened in your team? What happened? I saw that there was a problem between you people. What goes on? What what happened? Uh, I hope you get what I'm going at. But at this feedback point in this particular game, it is advisable that you use it not only as a emotionally uh, social tool, but as a training tool as well. You can train your participants and it starts here. Inception. It is here that you transition from their quarrels inside the teams, from the, from hard, uh, the hardship of managing their own squad with those ropes uh, and hardship of managing the entire five squads running around in several directions. So it is easy to make a comparison to the society like as a whole because their squads, a tightly knit group are families or, or social groups which on the face value are bonded and they have the same objectives, but they may have problems attaching to each other and entirety of the group is like the community or the, or the state. 
and it is easy to show how 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 low is the perception of one person and this is uh, shown by the narrow view of the flashlight like you see in being a person in society you have as much knowledge about the entirety of the workings as you have in complete darkness only equipped with one flashlight you see something and if you focus on it you see it very well but uh you you miss out on many things else so this is how you make a segue into discussion at which point i hope you will be uh all happy and hyped up with your participants and they will be flapping around or alternatively they will just fall asleep from being so tired because that happens as well do not uh, get sad if it happens that's that this is a winter game because uh, in winter uh, night comes earlier and it's easier to organize it in like reasonable hours not at midnight or something that's that roll credits thank you for attention and more questions to debriefing maybe or any questions actually i know it's two to five but uh, i would just like to ask you for patience for like, I don't know, for as many questions will take part. Of course, if you need to leave, just go and leave. You will see the recording. In the meantime, I can see no questions on the Zoom, but maybe somebody will come up. I hope you like the game because I do. It may be intimidating at first glance, but after you get used to it, it's awesome. It's really my preferred way of, uh, of, of making games. And chronologically, this was the first of those that I made for you. So when I don't see any questions, I'm going to remind you how it works, the training. So it works like this, that Martin had his two hours now of uh, speaking on presentation and he's game designer. So you get the knowledge uh, directly from his head, but he is also a good writer of game design document, which you already have, and which is there and should be enough. Uh, also, like the two combine, if you combine the two, so this training and game design doc, you already should have all the answers for your questions. And if it's something is not there, you can come up to our Facebook group. And I'm just giving you the link to this and then ask a question or maybe share your idea how you change something or how you make your own barricades or some dressing up or whatever you would like to share with others. I advise you buying hazmat suits. They are cheap like hell. They really, because they're supposed to be one time only, they are really cheap, like 50 cents Euro sense or something like this. So, so, and they're cool. It makes more, more uh, climate in the game, more mood. <laughs>